Well, I thank you so much for that introduction, Joe, and uh, it was hard to believe that you were talking about a simple person like myself. Um, you know, when the battalion that I commanded back in uh, the 4th Infantry Division, we had a great motto, and it said, duty, not reward. And I think that lots of times, I just want people to understand, never thank me for doing that which is right and doing that which will make sure that we protect our country and we protect our best and most favored ally in the Middle East, which, of course, is Israel. And, uh, well, thank you. But as I stand here today, I have to tell you, uh, you know, Reverend O'Neill Dozier just came in. I just got finished speaking at his church's 25th anniversary. Uh, and that's a great man, too. But I must tell you, as I get ready to prepare to go up to Washington, D.C., and I'll be moving up there on the 29th of December, and I'm not sleeping in my office, folks, no way. Okay. I've had enough of that hard living. But we are at such a critical and decisive point for the future and the legacy, not just the United States, not just Israel, but for what happens with Western civilization. What happens to that bright and shining light that talks about the respect of individual? What happens to that bright and shining light that talks about the freedom of conscience? What happens to the bright and shining light that talks about the rule of law all across our great world? And if we lose that aspect of what separates us from the autocrats, the dictators, the despots, and the theocrats that we see on the opposite side, then we go into a new dark ages. Then we really have to ask ourselves, what are we leaving to our children and our grandchildren? And when especially you think about the great sacrifices the men such as my father made back during World War II or Korea, all the way up to Vietnam to the present, the sacrifices that men and women are making right now to be out there on freedom's ramparts so that we can sit here in liberty and we can share these ideas and talk freely about the future and the legacy of Israel and America and the world. Now, there's a fantastic quote that Gail Tenzer always uh, shares with other people. And I think this is what really comes home when we talk about the, this issue. Because there's no need of me taking all the academic uh, and historical perspectives, but I just want to talk to you from the heart. And that is, when tolerance becomes a one-way street, it leads to cultural suicide. And that's where we are. Because if we are not willing to stand up and call a certain wrong or wrong. If we are not willing to stand up and identify and say who the enemy is, when we have a national security strategy that talks more about global warming than it does about Islamic extremism, Muslim terrorism, Islamic terrorism, when we are now talking about overseas contingency operations and man-caused disasters, something is wrong. We have become upside down. You know, when we don't want to say that there is a group of individuals out there that are the antithesis of who we are and what we stand for and what we believe in, but yet we want to continue to, you know, make our way of life subservient. We have a recalcitrance. We have a fear. We have something that is keeping us, holding us back from saying that there is nothing wrong was standing upon the Judeo-Christian faith heritage that we find in the United States, that we find in Israel, we find all across Western civilization. So I think first and foremost what we must do is we move forward and you can definitely count on me to be this voice. We've got to... Thank you. We have got to recognize who the enemy is. Because my fear is that right now we are standing in some 1930 Sir Neville Chamberlain moment where we really do believe that we can compromise and negotiate and we can appease, appease people who mean to kill you and harm you. And when I sit back and I hear so often everyone talks about, well, it's just the Taliban or it's just Al-Qaeda. I mean, it's such a narrow focus. That would be just the same as if, you know, the United States of America went to war and said, we're only going to go fight the second platoon of Charlie Company of the enemy. Nations have to understand and recognize what is it that is fueling the enemy that we are finding ourselves against. What are their goals and objectives? See, before al-Qaeda came along, the number one terrorist group that had killed more Americans was Hezbollah. And so we can't stop recognizing them. 
Or we can't recognize the fact that we are sending money into Gaza Strip, and Gaza Strip is controlled by a known terrorist organization, which is Hamas. You know, we made a very terrible mistake. You know, the Shah of Iran may not have been the most perfect of gentlemen, but when we did not support the Shah of Iran and we allowed the Ayatollah Khomeini to take over power, what we did, we created the problems that we see right now. We created the resurgence of a radical Islamic totalitarianism, which is imperialistic in nature and its design. And we've got to understand that. We've got to understand that, true enough, we don't need to sit here and say it's every Muslim. But there is a core group of individuals that if we're not careful, they can easily destroy this country. I had an interview last week with a gentleman from the London Daily Telegraph, and he said, well, don't you think that you're giving them too much credit, you're giving them too much, you know, props or something like that? And I said, very simply, let me, let me talk to you about some numbers. 19 people killed 3,000 people on 9-11. One person killed 13 American soldiers and wounded another 30. One person, if it had not have been caught, could have killed countless amounts of individuals in Portland, Oregon at a Christmas celebration. See, those are the odds. And so I'm not going to discount the onesies or the twosies because those are truly the numbers that can still affect things. You look at what just recently happened in Iraq with the car bombing there. We don't need to talk about what happened in Netanya. We don't need to talk about what happens in Sedrot. And if I didn't pronounce that right, remember, I am from Georgia, so I do have this <laughs> accent thing. But when I go there and I see the young children who are shell-shocked, when I see the playgrounds, they have bomb shelters next to it. Why? Why is that happening? And that story is not getting out. See, after you recognize the enemy, another thing that we need to do, we have to win this information operations war. Because when that whole Gaza flotilla tape came out, I was sitting there with my wife, and I said, Angela, those guys have paintball guns strapped to their backs. But everyone, no one really understood that, that they had to use their personal sidearms to defend themselves. We are giving the enemy every advantage, every opportunity we can, just the same as in Iraq and Afghanistan with our soldiers. The rules of engagement that we have created gives the enemy the initiative over our soldiers. So we have got to once again get out there and put our message out. Put our message out that says we stand for freedom. Put our message out that says it is not us who are killing just as many Muslims as are the terrorists. It is not us who are going into schools and decapitating headmasters. It is not us who are going up to girls' schools and throwing acid on young girls or gunning them down. It is not us that are shooting rockets and missiles from land that we continue to seed over in the hopes of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is coming where we must all stand upon a conviction. Because as my mom said, a man must stand for something or else he'll fall for anything. And right now we're falling. We're falling to the point where what happens when that whole thing about mutually assured destruction theory goes out the window? That's what we operated with with the Soviet Union, but that's not going to be a viable alternative or solution if Iran gets a nuclear device. When Mahmoud Ahmadinejad goes into Lebanon, he faces toward Israel and says, we stand for the destruction of the Zionist state. What more do you need? What more evidence do you need? There comes a time when if someone continues to poke you in the chest, you must understand that you have to take that serious. It reminds me of when Theo Van Gogh, who was a Dutch filmmaker, was heard saying, as he was being stabbed repeatedly to death to his assailant, can't we just talk about this? Now, I don't know about you, but when someone's driving a knife into my chest, I think the whole course of action of less having a intellectual discourse <laughs> is over. But yet, on a grander scale, that's what we're allowing to happen. You look all across Europe, the anti-Semitism that is happening there. You look at what's going on in London. There's a YouTube video where we see rioting Islamists chasing away the British police. Malmo, Sweden, what was once a thriving Jewish community there, I believe, has dwindled down to about 500. 
people afraid to walk around with their yarmulkes, people afraid to walk around and profess their Jewish faith in Europe. This is where we are in our country. And if you go back and you study history for the Jewish people, you were driven out of your homeland. You were driven off the Arabian Peninsula. You were driven because of the horrors of the Inquisition out of Spain. You were driven out of Eastern Europe. You withstood the Holocaust. We finally said that we would return the Jewish people back to their homeland. And immediately after May of 1948, you were attacked. When does the time come when we say enough is enough? It's very simple. Where do you go after Israel? Do you come to the United States of America? Because the clock is ticking here just as well. And that is the challenge that we have. We can sit around and we can talk about all the things with our economic situation. And we can fix our economic situation. We can get Americans back to work. That's not an issue. But even once we recreate economic prosperity in this country, all the great technological advancements, all the biotech advancements, all the beauty that you see in Israel, if you can't have safety, if you can't identify your enemy, if you can't stand up to that threat, then it's all for naught. If you're held hostage within your own boundaries, it's all for naught. So in accepting this award, I tell you one simple thing. It is my duty to stand up to defend Israel. Thank you. It is my duty to do that because when you're a young man growing up in the inner city of Atlanta, Georgia, and on Sunday mornings when you're going up to Fort Street United Methodist Church for Sunday school and you read all those great stories from the Old Testament, you become one with that land. And when finally in December of last year, this exact same time frame, I had my first trip to the Holy Land and I saw the history and I stood there upon Masada and I realized, as I have told so many of you, that what Eleazar said there was give me liberty or give me death, which is the exact same thing that Patrick Henry said here in the United States of America. So in defending Israel, I will be a staunch defender of my and your United States of America from hence and forevermore. So God bless you all. Thank you for this great award. And thank you so much, Jeff.